This hour of the Costa Report is brought to you by Dole Food Company, the world's leading producer and distributor of fresh fruits and vegetables. Welcome to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and thank you for joining me for another two hours of Straight Talk Radio. Before we get the program started today, uh, I want to take a moment to thank listeners for their comments on my article about gun control, which appeared in USA Today this week. If you missed the article, you can still grab it online by typing in USA Today and Rebecca Costa on your computer or mobile device. I, I hope you'll take a moment to read it because it just might change the way you see the current debate on gun control. My guest today is also here to shed light on an equally important controversy. In just a few moments, the man largely responsible for getting the mess which Hurricane Katrina left behind under control will be with us to talk about why recovery efforts following Hurricane Sandy have continued to stumble in spite of millions and millions of dollars of relief monies. He'll also weigh in on the recent corruption charges levied against former New Orleans Mayor Ray Nagin, who is alleged to have have accepted favors from private individuals and contractors during and after the Katrina cleanup. We're privileged to have with us the man known as the Raging Cajun, General Russell Russell Honoré, with us on the program today. Before the general joins us, um, let me just add that Honoré is a native of Lakeland, Louisiana. He received his undergraduate degree from Southern University and A&M College and his master's in human resources from Troy State University. He also holds multiple Multiple PhDs from Troy State University, Southern University and A&M, and Stillman College. Honoré joined the Army in the 70s, and since that time, he has served our nation for almost four decades in a number of command positions in Korea, Germany, and throughout the United States. He was the commanding general of the 2nd Infantry Division in South Korea, vice director for operations J-3, the joint staff in Washington, D.C., deputy commanding general of the 1st Cavalry Division in Fort hood texas and well you know i could go on and on but we'd run out of time to find out what the general has on his mind these days about the direction our country is moving in the truth is most of us remember the general for his no nonsense john wayne style leadership after he was designated commander of the joint task force for katrina where he was responsible for coordinating military relief efforts across the hard-hit gulf areas fema along with all other relief and law enforcement agencies had failed across the board when Honoré stepped in. And what he accomplished in short order was nothing short than a case study in leadership under fire. It's my pleasure to welcome to the program an American patriot and hero, General Russell Honoré. Welcome to the program, General. Well, good afternoon and good afternoon to all your listeners around the country. It's great to be here with you. Thank you so much for taking time to be with us. So so let's jump right into the lessons we should, and I say should, have learned from Katrina. Why do we seem to be stumbling when it comes to this recovery effort from Hurricane Sandy? We still have folks without power who can't move back into their homes. We still have debris in the roads. What What is going on? Well, it's a typical case of politicians over-promising and under-delivering. Recovery from a disaster is a hard, uh, almost impossible mission for people who are living on fixed income and poor people. And people fail to understand that. They go in, they make these promises, money is coming. But you must understand, unless you've gone through one of these disasters and gone through a recovery, everything you get from your insurance company, grants you might get from the government, all of that come in a contested way. You have to prove and double prove everything. That's what makes the rebuilding so hard for people. The other thing is, in this case, FEMA changed the standard on the rebuild line, at what level buildings have to be rebuilt at if they're going to get FEMA assistance. So, uh, and they did it probably for the right reason. So uh, recovery is hard. It's made difficult because insurance companies don't want to pay what they don't have to pay, and the government don't want to give you what you can't prove. Now, so, isn't this a case, General, where it just gets so complicated that the average person on the street can't find their way to get the assistance? That is a big problem. That is a big problem. Again, people with means 
have a way to work through this. They have lawyers, they have consultants, but the people that suffer the most are middle class and working people. And of course, the poor people who were living in public housing, uh, they uh, are the last to get any assistance because they are the least served and have access to uh, government services. And, and so the more complicated, I mean, we can say that we make these services available to people. We can say, look, they could do this, they could do this, they could do this. And we make a long list, a long laundry list of all the services that are available to somebody. But if we make it complicated enough, the average person who needs that help can't ever get access to it. That is correct. And there's always a gap between what your insurance company will give you what FEMA might give you as a grant, and you know, you to get money from FEMA as an individual in your home, if you make over a certain amount of money, you're not going to get anything. So, and it doesn't matter what you lost. That's right. You have to show a dire need uh, for this to get back in your home. So there's always a gap between those numbers, and that is what caused so much frustration on so many people's part. On the other hand, uh, the municipalities uh, they will do well. Uh, FEMA, along with the rest of the federal government, they'll go in there and they'll rebuild all the public housing. They will uh, replace sewer lines. They'll replace fire stations, rebuild schools. That public works is a beautiful thing. If you're watching uh, television and you're looking at the Super Bowl, you look at New Orleans. Look, New Orleans, our central business district, look brand new to a state that has been rebuilt by the federal government. Uh, but when you go out into the neighborhoods down in the Ninth Ward, you will still see blight. You'll see homes that have been rebuilt because individuals dealing with the government have a hard time getting what they need to move back into their homes. So where has leadership failed these people? Well, you know, we were at one point, uh, what, 10 days after Sandy and the mayor of New York wanted to have a marathon. Mm -hmm. Duh. Think about it. Yeah, you know, what kind of message did that send? Yeah, that city was ready to move on. They wanted to be known as the financial capital of the world. They were still having conventions. Yet FEMA workers were driving three hours to get to New York to take care of people because there were no hotel rooms available. Mm -hmm. So that is the dilemma we run in is that the affected areas suffer. The areas that's not affected, the more flood areas, they want to move on and they continue to do business like nothing happened. Uh, look, uh, we've got a dilemma in America because the people who are most affected by these storms are what I call the people live on Railroad Street. Uh, the politicians described the world uh, in the last elections, uh, President Obama's first election, him and Mr. McCain used to talk about Wall Street and Main Street. Yeah. Go so with Wall Street. Main Street, I have a little different definition. I say Main Street people are people with jobs and people who can get jobs. But, Rebecca, there's another street out there. It is called Railroad Street, and a third of America lives there. The people that died in New Orleans came off of Railroad Street. Who are they? The elderly, the disabled, and the poor. A third of America. That's right. And, a, and after a disaster, we have to understand that it's easy to point fingers and say, well, gee, they should have stocked up on water. They should have bought batteries and flashlights. These people are living paycheck to paycheck. They don't have the means or the money to be proactive and to prepare. If they did, I'm sure they would prepare. But, you know, I, I hear a lot of people get very judgmental and say, well, we warned them. They should have gone out and bought a week's worth of food. They should have stocked up on batteries. They don't have the money to do that. And I don't know why people cannot understand that those folks who you describe that live on Railroad Street even have trouble preparing for a disaster. And I know that that's something we're going to talk about in this next segment because you have committed yourself to a culture of preparedness. But I want to talk about how these people on Railroad Street, how do they prepare? Because if they're the ones that are most victimized by these disasters, then they're where our attention should go. We have to take a short commercial break. When we come back, we're going to find out about the most important lessons in leadership. Stay tuned. You're listening to the Costa Report. Just about everyone knows that fruits and vegetables are good for our health, but not everyone knows how to build a healthier plate. 
Hi, I'm Amy Tobin, a cookbook author and culinary expert. For each meal, nutrition experts recommend filling half of your plate with fruits and veggies. Whether it's fresh berries with your breakfast cereal, a wrap filled with your favorite roasted vegetables for lunch, or a medley of crunchy veggies for a pre-dinner nibble, Dole provides the freshest and highest quality produce available. When you load up on all the nutritional good stuff, you give your meal an instant boost of color, flavor, and texture, plus vitamins and minerals and fiber. Everything your body needs to succeed. For nutritional inspiration and to learn more about Dole's fresh, whole, and cut vegetables and a full line of berries, visit Dole.com. With Dole as your partner in health, the possibilities are endless. Visit Dole.com. Now here's something to think about. If we're having the same problems in the United States that every other country is struggling with, then are these problems really domestic issues? At what point do we wake up and say, hey, if it's happening to everyone, it means it's happening to our species. That's why I'm asking you to read the Watchman's Rattle, because when you do, you'll see that the very idea that there are domestic and international threats is a myth. All of the problems we face today, problems like unemployment, debt, climate change, terrorism, nuclear proliferation, even the spread of pandemic viruses involve other nations. So please take a moment to pick up the Watchman's Rattle. It's a perspective you'll not find anywhere else, and it offers us solutions you won't find anywhere else. Get the Watchman's Rattle. Do it now. You'll be glad you did. Severino's Bar and Grill in Aptos has a new menu for the new year with fresh salads, tasty appetizers, and affordable entrees. If you've enjoyed Severino's Bar and Grill before, it's time to come back for the new tastes. If you haven't been by before, come on in. What's stopping you? Severino's is a great place to meet with family or friends. Call 688-8987 or online at seacliffin.com. Try some fantastic new dishes at Severino's Bar and Grill inside the Seacliff Inn off Highway 1 in Aptos. That's the sound of you and your family being radiated with potentially harmful radiation by your PG&E smart meter. Now there is a solution. Smart meter guard. Let's slide a smart meter guard over your smart meter and listen again. Nothing. Smart meter guard blocks over 98% of the radiation being emitted from your smart meter. Live radiation free at your home or office with smart meter guard. For more information, visit our website at smartmeterguard.com. That's smartmeterguard.com. Ranger Station, Ranger speaking. Hi, I'd like to report a bear sighting, as in Smokey Bear. Continue. I was burning yard waste. He told me to remember that if it's too hot to touch, it's too hot to leave. You know, 9 out of 10 wildfires are caused by humans. That means 9 out of 10 wildfires can be prevented. I know that now. As usual, the talking bear gets all the credit. Always burn responsibly and contact your local fire department for open burning regulations. Brought to you by the U.S. Forest Service, your state forester, and the Ag Council. Learn more at SmokeyBear.com. Only you can prevent wildfires. Dave Allen here. Remember this, Sundays, 4 p.m., for an array of different world-acclaimed, eclectic, esoteric conversation and guests. Every Sunday at 4 p.m., right here on AM KSO, and realize why... I'm not going nowhere. I've got to stay. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is the individual largely credited with bringing law and order back to New Orleans and for the successful recovery effort following Katrina, General Russell Honoré. Now, General, I read your book on leadership, and one of the first principles you talk about is the fact that a leader must learn to do the routine things well. So here's my question. Are sudden disasters like Katrina and Sandy or, or even a terrorist attack part of what you mean uh, are routine things is this the new normal uh i think uh a better uh answer to that would be the second the point two which is don't be afraid to take on the impossible because the definition of a disaster is that you've been overwhelmed your government cannot handle the situation doing the routine things well is leaders such as these mayors and governors are becoming familiar with the disaster response plans 
and they are familiar with the language and what to ask the government for in terms of preparing and doing the routine things well, they understand what is the most uh, uh, dangerous scenario that might happen in their city and then the consequences of that. That would be uh, what leaders like uh, mayors and governors need to be most concerned with. And then uh, not being afraid to take on the impossible, because when you hit a disaster hit you, uh, you are not going to be able to control the outcome unless you're well prepared and people are going to die and you need to be prepared to deal with that and tell people where they can get help and make sure you are sending help to the most vulnerable population. When you walked into that, now I happen to know a little bit about what happened in Katrina and also on uh, other on the ground disasters because I, uh, you may not know this general, but I'm a first responder for the American Red Cross. So I know that frequently when I walk in, I'm walking into chaos. When yeah. you walked into Katrina, you were walking into a war zone. It, yes. Now, how did you secure that war zone? What was it that you did to get control over that large territory? Well, number one, to get people uh, the ability to talk with one another, hand out uh, satellite phones to every mayor I ran into that didn't have one, and to get them to start talking to one another as opposed to just talking to the press. Number one, number two, that the disaster caused the biggest problem. It's not the governor, it's not the president of the United States that caused this storm. That was caused by act of nature. Now let's start working as a team. Politicians are too quick to pass the blame as opposed to saying, hey, let us work through this. Let us focus on our people. They want to say, well, the federal government is not doing enough. Well, you know what? If the roads were open, the federal government would be there. If the uh, the airports were open, they would be there. The definition of a disaster is that you've been overwhelmed by your ability to deal with and take care of the people. Too much happened in Katrina where initially people were blaming the federal government uh, for not being there quick enough when, in essence, the infrastructure broke with about 60,000 people in the city that didn't evacuate. Right, but it, it's the local infrastructure broke down. It wasn't the federal infrastructure. That is correct. The levees broke. Uh, got the roads got overmatched, but some stupid things happened before that. Rebecca, I got to tell you, the mayor of New Orleans, who's now coming on indictment, to his credit, on Friday before the storm, he was trying to evacuate the city, and the school board, which don't work for the mayor, which happens in a lot of cities, these independent uh, elected officials decided to keep school open in New Orleans on Friday. So he's trying to evacuate the city. Voluntary evacuation, school stays open. That, and, that's so, and he doesn't have the authority to close the schools. Right. In most cases, unless there's a state of emergency been declared, if it's constitutional that the mayor can do that, uh, they don't have the authority. The other thing is the Saints played a, a football game that Friday night. <laughs> yeah. The president is on the television telling people, hey, this storm is coming in the Gulf. Get ready to uh, evacuate. Well, guess what? 80% of the people did evacuate. That Saturday morning, Katrina came Sunday, uh, Saturday, LSU had a football game in Baton Rouge, 80 miles away. Now, what, what do you say to people? Okay, so I, I've got to ask you this. What do you say to people who say 80% were smart, they listened to the mayor, they evacuated, the other 20% got their just desserts? No, the, the people that didn't leave, storm came on the 29th of the month. That's Railroad Street uh, population. Uh, most of the people that died were from Railroad Street. They and were, they, they had no way to get out. Did they have a way? Were, were there ways for the people on Railroad Street to get out? There was some on Saturday. But by that time, the majority of the people that were leaving in cars, the streets was all backed up. That plan could have been better. But you got to understand... The people that evacuated, did not evacuate, were least connected to what was going on. We think everybody's on the Internet. We think everybody at that time had an iPod. They didn't. Uh, the elderly, the disabled, and the poor are, are not as connected as the rest of the community. Those that were informed, uh, you know, people that were working class people, most of them, their cars didn't work. Those on fixed income, they didn't have any money. The checks don't come until the first of the month. Those were the dilemmas we had why 
that other 20 percent did not evacuate. You know, we're always really quick to come in on the back end after the disaster, but we don't seem to have any apparatus to help Railroad Street get money, get access to resources to get out and to preempt them getting trapped. Why don't we have any kind of assistance program on the front end as part of your culture of preparedness? Well, you know, that that brings up the bigger issue, Rebecca, is how we deal with the vulnerable population, the elderly and the disabled. About 15% of our population have some disability. I can tell you those people that were left in the Rockaways there in New York that were eventually evacuated last minute and after the storm hit, they come, they were in public housing. Mm -hmm. uh, they had, don't have cars. They're on fixed income. Many of them have in-home health care. The others live in nursing homes. Uh, that is the dilemma we have. And to get on the front end of it, as you say, it requires local uh, teams that can come together and evacuate them uh, before the storm arrives. Just this year, we had a hurricane. Hurricane Isaac came to Louisiana, Category 1. And wouldn't you know, after the storm hit, we had the great Louisiana National Guard going in to have to evacuate nursing homes that were flooded by Category 1 that were outside the levee system. Why weren't those people evacuated before the storm? I don't know. But it comes back to public policy on these uh, type of events that the nursing home be evacuated when we know that there's a threat coming. You know, I'm an evolutionary biologist, General, and I will tell you that what has caused human beings to be at the top of the food chain above all other living organisms on the earth is our ability to look ahead and see the consequences that are coming and then to fashion an action in the present to avoid a negative outcome. We are master preemptors, but it feels to me we have squandered this capability. I think you're right. And, you know, when the people in New York looked down on what was happening in New Orleans, they said, well, you know, our leadership's better, our police department's better, uh, et cetera. That, that was kind of the tone coming out of New York uh, after Katrina. And then we saw Isaac come last year, and we saw uh, Sandy come this year. And they, they come to find out, uh, one of the things that happened during Katrina was the New Orleans Police Department evidence room was flooded because it was in the basement of the courthouse. Yes, yes. Well, I'm sorry to interrupt you, General. We just have to take another break, and we're going to try to get back to the principles of leadership when we come back. You're listening to the Costa Report. We all know that the wrong time to start planning is when we're under fire and there is no time to plan. But it's also true that most of us are not prepared for when we, or a family member, suddenly needs expensive nursing home care. Take your estate, for example. Whether it's small or large, how sure are you that your will is legal? Are your children poised to avoid costly probate and reap the benefits of what you want them to have? Or will they be left, like seven out of 10 families are each year, with piles of paper and no idea what your intentions were? My name is John Lawton, and I have been helping families through their most difficult transitions in life for over three decades. Beginning in January, I'll be answering your questions about estate planning and elder care in a new segment on the Costa Report called Family Matters. We'll talk about everything from your care, your children, your pets, and your peace of mind. So join me every Friday, starting in January, right here on your favorite weekly news program, The Costa Report. Ben Loman Market. Low price, great savings, quality, and service that doesn't always cost you more. Hello, KSEO customers. This is Adam at the Ben Loman Market in the Meat Department telling you about our one-day-only meat bonanza sale, Friday, February 1st. We're offering a variety of items such as baby back ribs, boneless skinless chicken, New York steaks, shrimp meat, ribeyes, and much, much more. It's a perfect way to stock up the freezer at a drastically low, low price. And since the sale is Friday before the Super Bowl, why don't you invite some friends over for the San Francisco 49ers Super Bowl? Buy in bulk and get great savings. And remember, this is a one-day sale only, Friday, February 1st, at the Ben Loman Market in the Meat Department. Thank you. Ben Loman Market. Compare and save. You don't always have to pay more for better service and quality. 
a proud member of Think Local First Santa Cruz County. If you're the type of person who likes to volunteer and help others, this should interest you. What better way to help people than to help them overcome their health challenges? Longevity has been helping people overcome their health challenges for years. Our approach to health is drastically different than medical doctors who mostly only treat symptoms. As a veterinarian, Dr. Joel Wallach discovered that many common disease states are actually preventable and reversible. Our mission at Longevity is to educate Americans about their own health. If you like helping people, join us in our fight to save America. While you're helping people prevent and overcome health challenges, you will also be able to build a lucrative home-based business. So what are you waiting for? Come join us and help save America. For more information or to order, call Andy or Phyllis Anderson at 888-245-0300. That's 888-245-0300. I have a T. We're going to do 25 now. 50 now. 75. We're going to 300. 325. 353. 75. We're going to 400. 425. 450. Imagine finding an old painting or chair or fishing lure while rummaging through the attic. Is it junk or is it hidden treasure? Hello, I'm Rob Slowinski of Slowinski Auctions and Appraisers in Scotts Valley. Before you throw that item out, you better make certain it's not hidden treasure. And the way to do that is to join me at 2 p.m. Saturday afternoon here at KSEO for Hidden Treasures Radio Show. Put that item on the table in front of you and call the show. We'll figure out what that item is, where it came from, what it's worth, give or take. So don't throw that item out. Instead, join me, Rob Slowinski of Slowinski Auction Company, Saturday afternoon at 2 p.m. for Hidden Treasures Radio Show. Is it junk? Or is it hidden treasure? Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is General Russell Honore. And before the break, you were making the point that we have the ability to preempt, but we don't always use it, and we seem to be focused on these disasters after the fact. I wanted to give you an opportunity to finish your point, General. Yeah, I think uh, the concept of being prepared is critical uh, when you asked earlier about what, how do we prepare Railroad Street, we work on informing them. We need to teach first aid in our schools as well as to encourage people to volunteer and to, for the government to recognize that they've got to focus on the most vulnerable population before, and during, and after. Uh, a lot of the response that happened is how do we protect people from looting? You'll see the police is more focused on that than they are many times and actually going into all apartments and seeing how people are doing. So we've got to do better at that. We can do better. And uh, this is a, a big, what we need to do to create that culture of preparedness. Now let's talk about the third principle of leadership. Don't be afraid to act even if you're being criticized. Absolutely. Uh, that is a, a message right now when we look at our leaders and what they're sidestepping. They're sidestepping the human capital in America. You know, we're importing skilled workers, nurses, and doctors. Yet, if you take right here in Louisiana, we put more of our young men uh, from poor communities, particularly African Americans, in jail than we have in college. Uh, we've got to fix that in all of America. I can tell you the shooting problem in Chicago has much to do about poverty-stricken community as it has to do with the availability of guns. Uh, we've got to fix that, uh, and we can't look the other way, because unless we fix that, we're going to continue a cycle from cradle the prison system in these poor communities, these urban areas, where these young people are growing up, they're undereducated, underserved, and end up shooting somebody, doing drugs, or go and go into prison. We've got to stop that cycle. But but aren't aren't all our leaders Keep that on? But general, aren't all our leaders dependent on popularity? No popularity, no reelection, no campaign money. I mean, how how do they how do they decide it's okay to be criticized as, and be a good leader and, and act for the greater good? How how can they do that? They their careers would be very short lived. Well, uh, I think. You know, when General Washington won our freedom, uh, he was focused on one thing, freedom. 
and uh, of our people, the people that fought for them, uh, with him, uh, our ancestors. They fought. They didn't fight for pay. They fought for freedom. We've got to have a clear understanding that progress and freedom is not free. It comes with sacrifice, and leaders need, pre- need to be prepared to do what we have to do to invest in our human capital, that part that's not participating in the economy, that's disengaged because they're not educated and it looks like we don't care about them. I spoke to one politician, they will just build more prisons. I said, well, how is that working out, buddy? Yeah, that's you know, right. Keep that's building right. more prisons, cause more we're, money. We're to- just basically warehousing a whole segment of our population. Right, and it goes back to young boys, males, in these poor communities that are not reading at uh, fourth grade reading level. they are tests that are being done in America right now, or surveys, to determine how many prisons we're going to need in 20 years, looking at fourth grade reading level inside of some of the... Isn't it awful that we can predict how many prisons we need by literacy levels? That we can do the math and, and, and be able to predict how many cells we need. I mean, I mean we are such uh, we're in such a ditch in terms of our thinking, and I couldn't agree with you more. Now, now we've been talking about leadership, and, and so let me ask you about former mayor of New Orleans, Ray Nagin. Uh, he's been indicted on corruption charges for accepting personal favors and bribes during and, and after the Katrina recovery. Now, one of the things I know is that the two of you have radically different styles of leadership, so I, I just wanted you to talk a little bit about what it was like working with Nagin when you landed there. Well, it, it was different. You know, he was emotionally charged. He was tired. Uh, he was uh, being beat up pretty uh, well in the press. Uh, and uh, his response was to uh, yell back that it uh, he needed help from the state and the federal government and that it appeared that nobody wanted to help him where he lost sight of is when the airport's closed, the roads are closed, it's going to take uh, a couple of days to get the logistics in there. Politicians forget responding to a disaster is not about getting on television and promising the world. It's about something called logistics, (laughs) Rebecca. That's right. Getting food and water. You I know mean, that. forget the press. you got to open up roads. If you don't open up roads, nothing can get in and nothing can get out. Right. So you're going to take you some time to get to everybody. So what many of them don't understand, as opposed to blaming the government for not being there, use that time to uh, get people prepared, communicate with them, and uh, make sure that they are prepared as they can before the disaster comes. Then communicate to the people on where they go to get help. That is the biggest thing politicians need to do. And in this case, race spent a lot of time, uh, sometimes with not a well-articulated message, but an emotionally charged message that sometimes uh, he didn't, uh, people didn't take him with the respect they should have because he was uh, shooting off, uh, blaming, started the blame game early, as opposed to saying this is the help we need and uh, we want to take care of our people. And he didn't seem to inspire confidence of his people. And as you point out, part of leadership is to get people to do the right thing. And this is the key word you use, willingly. Absolutely. And to do that, you have to have a team. Uh, Rebecca, look, the, the, there was a decisive relationship between the mayor and the governor. Uh, the press made a big deal out. I saw them work as close as they could during the disaster, but the press kept talking about well, you know, Reagan didn't support the governor when she ran for governor. Well, I didn't see that as a friction point, but it speaks to another point. The press will come in quick and heavy, and they start reporting. And that mayor and that governor never caught up with what the press was putting out in terms of being able to respond to it. They were dealing with logistics issue, and the press really did not serve them well. And looking in hindsight, many people I talked to in the press that they did some hasty reporting, which did not inspire confidence of the rest of the country as to what was happening in the city. That's right. However, he is a very big fan of yours. I mean, he credits you with bringing New Orleans back. Uh, I can tell you that uh, he uh, he wasn't hard to work with. Uh, from my relationship with him. No, he Uh, he was very grateful to have you show up and take charge. His heart was in the right place. He was overwhelmed. You know, uh, 80% of his city is underwater. Uh, About half of his police department 
uh, were isolated, either couldn't talk to them, they didn't know where their families were. And, you know, sometimes we make rules that are just turn out to be stupid. You know, they passed a law in the city of New Orleans a few years before Katrina that if you worked for the city, you had to live in the city. Well, guess what happened, Rebecca? The storm come, all the city workers live in the city. They all left. Right. Or they have to leave. I mean, and they were all evacuated or forced to evacuate or had to take their families out. So that is that's a systematic problem. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, now, you know, I wanted to move on to foreign policy because you spent quite a bit of time in South Korea, and now we've got this nuclear threat rearing its ugly head. As a former commander charged with that security in South Korea, what steps do you want to see our leadership start taking? Well, to be bold. Uh, as long as Please we do. walk around South Korea, you know, we need a little uh, Reaganism. Here, hey, look, we're not scared of you. Uh, we're going to communicate. We're going to look at you in the eye. We continue to uh, skirt around South, uh, North Korea like we're scared of. Them. Nobody wants to see a war. But as long as they can push South Korea around, and at the end of the day, what we do with North Korea, the South Korean people have to be prepared to cash that check. Because if we push too hard, and North Korea starts sending artillery shells, they're going to land in South Korea. And they can put thousands of them down in the first day. Absolutely. So we have a balancing act there to make sure that the people in South Korea have the will to stand up to the North. Now, General, we have to take our last break here. But when we come back, I'd like to continue this because I think that you have a lot to say about our security risks overseas. You're listening to the Costa Report. and we listened. The new and improved paperback edition of The Watchman's Rattle is now available in bookstores everywhere, including airports across the country. If you've been hemming and hawing about not having time to go online or pick up a copy, well, now you don't have any excuses. Find out why government gridlock, terrorism, epidemic obesity, crime on Wall Street, even problems with education and health care have an evolutionary basis to them. Because when you do, you'll never look at our problems the same way. So pick up the freshly printed paperback edition of the watchman's rattle don't wait do it now give yourself a real reason to feel optimistic that's the watchman's rattle available everywhere you are I'm here today with Scott Caraccioli, owner of Caraccioli Cellars. I have to say that every time that I've been by, it has been packed with people. It's more of a social environment. Yeah, it's really kind of a meeting place as well in Carmel. A lot of people come and taste a flight of wines before they go to dinner. We have a big screen TV in there. We feed all the games that are local and important, and it definitely becomes a meeting place for people. So you must get a lot of first dates there, maybe? You know, we get a lot of first dates, second dates. A lot of times it's couples that do come in, and we see them again after the first time. I can imagine, and I would suggest that if anyone's thinking about a first date, that might be a really nice place to kick it off. One more time now, where is the tasting room located and what are your hours? We're located right in the heart of Carmel by the Sea, right on Dolores between Ocean and 7th. We're open daily from 2 p.m. to 8 p.m. And on Fridays and Saturdays, we actually open up at 11 and stay open till 10 p.m. Radio is the best media in the world because you can be productive. You can learn and be creative. Now there's a way to make it 10 times better. This is Bob from Sea Crane, and if you have a high-speed internet connection and a CC Wi-Fi internet radio, then your reception problems are over. The CC Wi-Fi uses your internet connection to give you crystal clear reception. It has a dial and a speaker, so it offers a convenience of a regular radio. You can most likely listen to your favorite radio program and stations from back home, even if home is in a different state or country, with absolute clarity. The variety of stations available is incredible. It's a remarkable radio experience. 
To order a CC Wi-Fi, give us a call at 800-522-8863. That's 800-522-8863. Or visit us online at ccradio.com. C. Crane, the high-performance radio and light company. The original Stagnero family has been in business since 1879. The Stagnero name stands for quality, quantity, and great service. The family's Gilda's Restaurant on the Santa Cruz Municipal Wharf is still the fishing headquarters of the Santa Cruz area. It's where fishermen gather each morning for coffee and breakfast before heading out on the bay. Stop by Gilda's and say hi. Dino looks forward to meeting you at Gilda's on the center of the Santa Cruz Municipal Wharf. Hello, this is Donald Davidson, the host of the Perspectives Radio Show on Saturday at 12 noon. We have a variety of programs from constitutional rights and issues to controversial alternative health views. We interview well-known authors from many walks of life, attorneys from many fields, and internationally known health doctors. So to hear a different perspective, join me, Donald Davidson, special guests and regular guest hosts every Saturday at 12 noon for the Perspectives Radio Show right here on KSCO. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is General Russell Honore. And before the break, we were talking about the precarious position the South Koreans are in, especially with North Korea's ongoing nuclear program. And I believe, General, your position is that we need to come at this problem from a position of strength. So tell us a little bit about what you mean. Yeah, we need to ensure that the South Koreans uh, continue to modernize their army along with Japan, which is primarily a defense force, because they will be the front lines that will receive North Korean missile if this goes to a shooting war. The other thing we've got in the room is the same problem MacArthur and Truman had on the peninsula. China. You well, know, well now, I, now I can't let you get away with that. Explain what you mean. Well, uh, <laughs> uh, there... Might as well go for it, General. Uh, well, I'm going to go for it. You know, <laughs> China is a trading partner. The number two economy in the world, the U.S., Japan, I mean, leading the, the way there. We got China, 1.3 billion people. Uh, what you won't see people talk about is China is not anxious to see peace between North and South Korea. Uh, the South Korea uh, uh, economy, people make 20 times more per capita than the people in North Korea. The South Korea uh, democracy, uh, uh, the population is double of North Korea since the Korean War. So are you saying that South Korea, are you, are you trying to say that... In South Korea coming to its border and bringing that level of freedom and democracy to its people. So are you saying that South Korea is not only a, uh, a competitor to China, but it sets a bad example as a democracy, a functioning democracy? Well, South Korea is a functioning democracy. China does not want that level of democracy on its border. I see. And so they're not anxious anytime soon to see a resolution between North Korea and South Korea. But but doesn't North Korea's nuclear program play, uh, pose an equal threat to China? Do they, I don't. I, I don't. I can't imagine any country in Asia wanting to see the head of North Korea get a hold of a nuclear weapon. Can you? Well, you know, I think China is playing front room, back room on us. You know, ah, you know, boy. And in the meantime, any disturbance that North Korea creates uh, cause uh, the U.S. to spend resources, energy, uh, political, economic, uh, military uh, capital to keep the North Koreas in check, which means that gives China. We're a competitive nation with China to be able to put its resources in other things. That is my take on it. At the end of the day, it's the same problem Truman had. How do we keep the Chinese in check? At the same time, how do we have an economic relationship with China and borrow money from them, creating wealth in their country and building things in China so we can buy it cheaply in uh, our big box stores here in America? That's the dilemma. Can you have an economic relationship with an enemy? Well, let me put it this way. We've got about 310 million people that we know about. China has 1.3 billion. Uh, that, that is the challenge. And at some point in time, how do we kind of keep China in the box from being aggressive? 
You know, China is uh, moving forward with getting themselves an aircraft carrier. You know, that 1.3 billion people, all of them have needs. We've tried to do that through uh, trade and uh, through negotiations with China. See, we don't call them 1.3 billion people, General. We call them 1.3 billion consumers. That's how how we look at them. And I'm not sure that's such a great trade to get at more consumers, is it? Uh, It's not a great trade. And you got to remember... The size of the Chinese army is not based on their enemies, but it's big as it is to control the people inside of China. And you've got to remember, China on another level, on a daily basis, is doing cyber attacks on the United States of America, uh, downloading information in any place they can, and they're a major threat in the cyber world in terms of computer attack. I don't doubt it for one bit. Let me ask you this. Having been a commander overseas and also in this country, do you consider China to be our greatest threat? Do you think the the instability now in the Middle East with Egypt blowing up and and the fact that this Arab Spring was very, very short-lived, is that our greatest danger? I mean, where where do you point to uh, as a a, a former commander for four decades, sir? I think... Our immediate biggest threat is non-state actors. In the events like we saw happen in uh, Algeria, again, uh, a plant being built, in the shadows of that plant is people so poor, uh, a third of them don't have electricity, 50% of them don't have running water in their house, and the terrorists come along and say, hey, let's go attack these Americans. These Westerners are over here building. So you this. feel that these predators, real uh, these these uh, terrorists are really predators, and they and they look for uh, grossly impoverished areas where there's no hope of transition. Just like the drug lords in South Los Angeles, or in the boroughs of New York and in uh, New Orleans, they go where poverty is and run their drugs. The same thing is happening overseas, where terrorists are prolific in places where there's high poverty and low education level. Look at Afghanistan. Uh, Look now in Syria. I mean, that is the problem. Now, Doug Saunders wrote a book uh, called uh, Rival Cities, where he was talking about these hubs of poverty that that tend to uh, build up on the outside of metropolitan areas. And he says that uh, if the government doesn't build some pathway for assimilation for those that are poor and desperate, what eventually happens is that these areas of poverty, these these railroad streets, as you call them, they turn into nests for violence and uh, an upheaval. But when you do build a transition, when you do build some kind of a form of assimilation, what happens is is that those impoverished folks, they send their kids to college and they eventually become the, the new middle class. That is correct. And, and a country can grow out of that. The problem in Egypt, they overeducated a bunch of people and underdelivered on jobs. Uh, I was in Egypt several times. I had a driver, he had a master's degree in English, he would drive me for a month. He made more money in that one month than he did teaching school for the rest of the year. Mm-hmm. That is their problem. They have no economy. So you've got to build an economy when you educate the people so they can take care of their families and uh, buy food and have shelter. When that don't happen, you leave room for terrorism to uh, rule. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. When the Arab Spring happened, I said, well, unless they're going to create some jobs... Right. And build an economy. It doesn't matter what form of government you have, does it? You got it. It's come down to the economy where people can take care of themselves. When you got that many young men not working, no place to work, uh, that is going to be a friction. It's a problem in Egypt. It's a problem in Pakistan. It's going to be a problem in Egypt, in India, one of these days where you have these expanding population, an expanding middle class. And it's going to happen in China where people can't take care of their families. You know, at one time, the, the have-nots didn't know how bad they had it. But with the envision of the Internet and television, they're seeing how the rest of the world is living, and they're saying to themselves, why not us? And you know who's at the end of the Internet? It's the Americans. They see us as the poster of the Western world. That's right. Well, before we run out of time today, uh, General, where can listeners go to get more information about being prepared for disasters? And do you have a website where they can go to find out about your book on leadership? Yes, they can go to www.generalhonore.com. 
and they will find a lead there into Acadian Press or Amazon where they can order the book. And on preparedness, I'm a volunteer with the Red Cross. I wrote a book on survival. That book is available on Amazon. You can find it there. But the I tell people, go to the Red Cross and uh, www.redcross.org and do the three things. Uh, have Be prepared. Have an evacuation plan. Have three-day supply of food and water. And stay informed. Red Cross has the doctrine. They will come to your office and train you, or you can go to the Red Cross office and they will train you. So stay informed, have that three to five day supply of food and water, and have a weather radio so you can stay informed. Absolutely. That Red Cross doctrine works. Well, well said, General. I'm afraid that's our program for today, but before we let you go, please let me thank you for your service to the American people. Thank you, General. It was an honor to serve the greatest nation in the world. God bless America. If your station is leaving us after the first hour, my guest next week was the Director of Policy Planning in the State Department in the Bush Administration and Middle East Coordinator under President Clinton. American diplomat Dennis Ross will be here with us to talk about the growing instability in Egypt and other Arab Spring countries and the future of Israeli-Palestinian negotiations. Don't miss Dennis Ross next week, right here, same place, same time, on your favorite weekly news program, the last bastion of partisan free programming. Now stay tuned for the second second hour of the Costa Report when we take your calls. Hi, I'm Judy Profeta, owner, broker, and active real estate agent of Alon Pinnell Realtors, a locally owned real estate company. We've operated on the peninsula for over 16 years, currently located on the corner of Ocean and Dolores and Unipero between 5th and 6th in downtown Carmel. We serve the Monterey Peninsula, focusing on Carmel, Pebble Beach, and the Carmel Valley. Our firm of about 50 agents represents everything from Carmel Cottages to Pebble Beach Estates and oceanfront properties to Valley Vineyards. We are actually known for our vast inventory of fine properties. Drop by and see us, or better yet, visit our website at apr-carmel.com. That's a pr-carmel.com or you can give us a call at 831-622-1040 and make sure you tell them Judy sent me. Discover the difference at the Garden Company. The difference in the way you're greeted. The difference in the quality and diversity of our plants. The difference in the knowledge of our staff and their commitment to your positive shopping experience. Hi, I'm Charlie Cupin of the Garden Company Nursery and Gift Shop a family-owned garden center since 1986. Let us help you create colorful containers for your deck, a fragrant planting for your entry, or an edible landscape for your personal harvest. You'll find everything you need, perennials, shrubs, vines, fruit trees, organic vegetables, earth-friendly products, pottery, soils, and much more. And there's our incredible gift shop with exquisite gift ideas for office parties, hostess gifts, Mother's Day, or any occasion. Discover why Good Times readers voted the Garden Company Best Nursery and Garden Supply. The Garden Company Nursery and Gift Shop, a proud member of Think Local First. 2218 Mission Street, across from Safeway, on the west side of Santa Cruz. The Garden Company Nursery and Gift Shop, a family-owned garden center since 1986. From San Jose to Salinas, Red Hot News Talk, AM 1080, KSCO, Santa Cruz.